Okie dokie, welcome to the Coogan Chronicles podcast, a podcast where two former child actors interviews the other child actors <laughs> about what it was like for them growing up in the spotlight. My name is Chris Marquette. I'm AJ Trouth. And we're your co-hosts uh, for the evening or morning or afternoon, whatever time it is that you're listening. We appreciate you being here. And today, before we get to our interview, AJ and I, you, you and I, we wanted to talk about um competition yeah yeah sort of competition between kid actors uh who were performing and i guess my question to you is did you ever feel like you were in a competition do you ever feel competitive do you ever feel a competitive nature from other kid actors yeah i definitely did you know when i was really when i was flying like things were working super well I didn't feel competitive. It was just mm-hmm. sort of a flow. Now as an adult, we would call it a flow state. You're just like on a solo mission. You're just, yeah, you know, you're just, just on fire and I'm, I'm walking on the beat on the beam and yeah. I will not fall off. Yeah. And, and you're getting, what anybody like else is doing. you're getting the roles that are the right roles for you and you're not getting the other ones. It's all working out. It's like, everything's going perfectly and there's never, you're not in this dark hole of frustration and competition. (laughs) Uh, Well, is that how competition starts is you don't get things for a while or you don't get things you care about and suddenly you're looking around at all the other people that might be getting them and wondering what you start comparing yourself to other people. Is that I feel like you're getting a little heated up right now just going (laughs) over it. No, no, no. What was it like for you? I I wasn't competitive at all. I I didn't, I felt a competitive nature from other people for Mm. sure. And there were a few people in particular that really stood out to me. How how old were you when you first recognized what that, what was going on? I was, I think where it really hit me over the head, I probably, I recognized it really young. I'd say even like seven or eight or nine years old. But it just, it was the only thing I recognized about it was that it was scary. That I was like, there's something, it's weird that that kid's not nice. And it took, it would take me a while to realize they were like, you know, yeah, they were being competitive. They were looking at me as competition instead of just kids being in a place. But where I really felt it for the first real time was I did a play. I did this play on Broadway at Madison Square Garden to just sort of <clears throat> toot my own horn here. I, but I did this big play and it was such a uh, grueling work schedule that they actually double cast the play. And so they would have two kids play each role. And so you would switch off. So because because there were uh, performances in the morning, sometimes morning, afternoon and night, usually just morning and night. So they would have to double cast it. So you would come in just for a day, do morning and night or just the morning and the other kid would do night. But what happens with that over the course of a few months is that occasionally you have to switch nights. And, um, and so you would go to the other parents and they left it to the kids' parents to work out if you wanted to switch a schedule and say, Hey, actually Friday night, we have friends in town. They want to come see the play. Can we put, can my kid take Friday night or, Hey, um, we've got this trip we're going out of town for. Is it all right if you guys cover Wednesday and Thursday of this week, that's how it would go. But the kid that played, uh, the play was a Christmas Carol and I played tiny Tim. And so it was me and another kid playing Tiny Tim, and the other kid playing Tiny Tim was a little fucking asshole. <laughs> he was just a little competitive bastard. You, you remember and his he, name? No, I'm not, not going to ask no, you to call him I, out. But. I, I actually, w- I'm, I'm glad some, the, some in the dark recesses of my mind, it just goes blank when you ask me that. I don't know. I remember his face, and I remember specifically these the little glares that he would give me. And part of that was he was just really competitive. I think he. When, when he would hear what would happen occasionally is they would say to me, you know, hey, uh, you want to do this interview for something as Tiny Tim or I, there's a parade as Tiny Tim. And since we're both playing that role at the same time, you know, you, you might feel slighted if they don't ask you to do it. I this love kid this. felt this slighted. Is so funny. <laughs> I know. Oh, I love this so that, dynamic. I know. So this kid felt slighted uh, occasionally is my guess. And he got really competitive with me and did not like me for absolutely no reason. And his mom did not like mine. So it, it was a real oh, yeah. cutthroat thing. So would they ever have you both show up to the same like charity event at the same oh, time? Oh yeah. Yeah. They would absolutely, <laughs> we did things together. We did lots of rehearsals <laughs> together. If there were ever like, you know, if there was like an event for the play where you'd come in, 
a few hours early and maybe meet schools of children or something. What did and, you guys think was going to happen? Like your your career was going to be made off of playing. I Tiny don't Tim know. From a Christmas no, Carol? no, not at all. And that's why I don't think I ever felt competitive. Is I didn't right. see what I was doing. Never felt like there was a. I don't know. I, I wasn't getting cash and prizes. You know, it's not, that's not how I felt about it. Now, and Chris, so here, here's what I'm curious about. Do you think he got this competitive streak from his parents? Because that's always been my theory that it comes from the parents. And oh, the I'm kids sure. Inherit it. Okay. Absolutely. But there are, I think, instances where kids have it on their own, for sure. I think one other good story I can tell um, really as fast as I can is sitting in an audition room with Shia LaBeouf in a, mm-hmm. in a waiting room. And Shia, I didn't realize, you know, we became friends years later, and I didn't realize how competitive he was with all the actors in the room. And he made up this story to all of us in the waiting room about how the audition process, the call, the final callback we were all on for, I don't even remember what, was so, they had been through such a process. They had seen thousands, tens of thousands <laughs> of kids from across the country, nay, the globe. And we were the final five kids that we were seeing. And I, I remember he thinking- psyched you out, dude. He, that's all he was doing. He was literally trying to make everyone nervous. And I remember years later going, dude, I was wondering, I've always wondered, how did you know that? How did you know that we were like the final five out of hundreds of thousands? And he didn't even remember. He was like, no, oh, of course I not. must have made that up. And I was like, well, why also would you make the- that up? And he said, I was trying to psych everybody out. And I was like, I- that's so strange. You felt a competitiveness here. On the Even Stevens audition, I know when he was auditioning for the part of Lewis, because I heard this from the producers, at the final call, he went around to all of the other actors auditioning for the part of Lewis and said, hey, I'm shy. I'm playing the part of Lewis. I, you know what? I can like, actually say that's true because I you was were auditioning for it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I do so, remember that. So somebody's yeah. parents went, somebody's mother or father went into the the casting office and said, hey, there's a kid out here saying that he already booked the role. The yeah, producers had to here? come out and tell Shia, what are you doing? You can't tell him that <laughs> because he didn't have the role yet. But that was that's just hilarious. his way of psyching people out. Well, it worked, didn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. It I mean, it, it is a strange. I think we're gonna, you know, it'd be interesting to know as we interview people. You know, maybe we find some people that were competitive like that, and maybe we find some people that have no idea that never felt it. I think it'll be really interesting. Well, and the last point to touch on, and I know we want to get to to our interview, but the last point to touch on is how competition in that way affects young people's psyche, mm. and it can be a difficult thing, and it's different from sports in that. The amount that you have riding on succeeding or, or quote unquote winning the role versus winning the game is quite different. Winning one game in sports is not necessarily going to win your life. Now, I know it's different on a level of like, you know, an Olympic athlete or something like that. Um, but as far as regular school goes, on, but, you know, on the flip side of that, winning the role or, you know, getting the role does have the potential of changing many, many things about your life. So there are, the stakes are higher is what I'm getting at. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I don't know the answer. I don't know if that has a positive or negative effect on a young person's mind, but it does change things. I know that it is different than what you would normally experience just going to school and, you know, doing yeah. normal things with your peers. Auditioning for a play even. In sure. A, in at school. school. Setting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when the stakes are higher, it does. It can change uh, how everybody's approaches the situation. And I, yeah, I wonder, I really wonder, I wonder who felt competitive or not. Cause I, you know, I can only really speak for myself and say what I experienced from other people and how I felt. Um, which was, I wasn't ever competitive. And in fact, our guest today is an actor named Josh Zuckerman. And Josh and I have actually been auditioning with each other for more than 20 years at this point. Um, I, not often, but I, I, we've seen each other in many a waiting room uh, reading for, for roles and things. And uh, Josh is a wonderfully talented, incredibly bright guy. Uh, you've seen him in all kinds of things because he's been acting his entire life. Uh, as a kid, I think his the probably the role that stands out, at least to us the most, is he played young Dr. Evil in Austin Powers' Gold Member. Um, and he, but even before that, he had worked on all kinds of things like the Amanda Bynes show, Desperate Housewives, 90210. He was in that Project Greenlight series, Feast, uh, on HBO. He did some really big movies, uh, Surviving Christmas with Ben Affleck and James Gandolfini, uh, and Lions for Lambs, the big Robert Redford movie that's really great. And, uh, and when he was a teenager, uh, or just coming out of being a teenager, he was in Sex Drive which was a really funny, uh, raunchy comedy uh, that I think is always really kept. I I feel like it's on Comedy Central every year. And um, yeah. And uh, without further ado, we give you Mr. Josh Zuckerman. 
All right, we're here with Josh. What's up, Josh? Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, you got it. You got yeah. it. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Josh, off the bat, man, I don't know if uh, anyone ever officially congratulated you uh, for this, but I don't, you know, you you made it. You successfully transitioned from a kid actor into an adult actor. You did it. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, I, I feel yeah. like I'm still uh, I'm still doing that transition. Oh, you're still but doing I, it. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you I, you got to check in with my IMDb star meter and see. Well, let's see, see where I'm I, at. Yeah, you might have crossed the finish line in our book at least. Okay. And the numbers are not great on that. You're it, not good. Those numbers, they're yeah, not good. They're, they're, my they're numbers like are not, not good. Or just terrible. in general. Just no, in no, general, no. going from child actor to successful adult oh, actor. Oh, I thought, I thought we were talking about the star meter. The odds aren't <laughs> no, good. No. Uh, yeah. No. Do you check your IMDb star meter? Um, I have been known to, uh, it's, it's awful. I, 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 no, I don't, <laughs> I don't check it regularly or anything, but I mean, sometimes something comes up and you want to see, uh, I, not necessarily star meter because I don't even have an IMDb pro account, but just, you're looking at something and then you happen to check it, look, you know, up to the top right of your profile page and you yeah. see your star meter and you go, fuck, or you go, yeah. <laughs> well, here's the, here's the concerning part is, are you then comparing it to other actors that you would potentially be competitive with to see where oh. their star meter is. Well, no, I don't, I don't go seek out other people, but sometimes okay. like, I remember this one guy recently I looked up, I was, uh, uh, it was, I remember why I looked him up. I think I was referencing him to someone and I said, here, here he is. And then it said top 500 and went, fuck, what, how is he in the top 500? <laughs> when we, was I ever in the top, you know what it should do is it should have a badge that say was in the top 500 this many times. Cause that would be like, you know, a little bit of a badge of, uh, you know, the history of your of celebrity in, uh, the world of celebrity, at least in the world of IMDb. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sort of you should thing. propose yeah. that. Yeah. Ridiculous, but yeah, yeah. I'll propose that new, uh, the new feature. Um, no, well, I know. It, I, oh, I, ahead, I wonder what, when, when, as it relates to your life as a former kid actor, did, was there ever a point? I'm sure that was not important to you at 13 years old. I don't even know if IMDb star meter was a thing at, when you were 13 years old, but was there ever a point where, where suddenly that s switched for you as an adult? Where suddenly you were more conscious of, you know, your, your popularity with on the internet or within the entertainment industry or anything did that I never really, no, I didn't really pay attention to that. I mean, you'd get fan mail more than anything back in the day. Oh yeah. Uh, like actual mail. On IMDb? Yeah. No, 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 no. Through your like agent. actual letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms right. of your fame or celebrity or, or whatever, if that now it's just because I did DMs. Because I did Disney Channel, you get a fair bit of fan mail. I don't know. The kids that watch Disney Channel, they like to write fan mail, I guess. And my mother would do most of the writing back to That's people. Great. And that was yeah, sweet. that was really nice. Yeah. That's sweet. To sort of segue real fast into, you know, you know, do you I've always wondered, do you really think of yourself as a former kid actor? You know, like your experiences as a child actor, do you still feel close to them or do, does it feel like a whole other life, like really distant? Um, I it, I suppose it does feel distant. I mean, you know, what's amazing about life, right? I mean, I, I certainly have been thinking a lot about this lately is how um, how you get from A to D. And you don't even realize that you hit B, C because B and C were A when you were there. And now you, it's just a strange thing to me that I, I don't really remember how I got here. I know where I'm at and I'm not, I, but, and I know where I was. Um, but I, I think that there was a lot of maybe, um, you know, maybe not being as aware as I could have been along the way. Um, so I, I don't, um, I, I don't, I think back about it as some kind of, um, it, not very clearly. I mean, I remember certain things. I remember certain people, certain, definitely, uh, certain events, uh, that were, uh, scarring in the, in the battlefield of, of being, a you know, a, a, a child actor, uh, fighting for mm -hmm. roles, but, um, and, and the little victories and all that. But, um, it, I don't remember how I really transitioned into being an adult, do you, then, do you ever, yeah, yeah. do you identify with it? Like, have you ever said to somebody casually, I'm a former child actor? <laughs> no, I don't think that that would be uh, uh, something to brag about in any context. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I, I guess I ask because I wonder when AJ and I first started this podcast, I really, when someone asked us, what is it about? I said, oh, well, you know, my buddy and I interview 
you know, a lot of friends, but of former child actors. And the term, I was like, I'm really uncomfortable with the term. I think it's because I've just been an actor. Like I, I've just been acting since I was a kid, like Josh has. That's why I wanted to ask him because I've been acting my whole life. I just don't, I didn't identify as a kid actor or an adult actor, just an actor. I just Yeah. Identify and and I guess maybe that's, that, that's my point is like, you're, you're, your, I mean, maybe your intentions change, but your intention was to get the role and to do a good job on the role or to work with this person or to do this type of thing and get better at your craft. And, and it's just, that's always been, and to make a living. And that, that's always been the, the goal, um, you know, even so, as a kid. Um, so does the yeah. term kid actor have a stigma associated with it that the term actor does not? I mean, I think so. I think a kid actor mm. assumes that you maybe are pushed into the industry, but you're doing something or maybe someone's taking advantage of you even. I mean, there's a lot of, of course, of course, uh, uh, myths uh, attached to that. I mean, as a, as a kid actor, it's like, well, you know, have you really decided that you like acting or is it just something you're doing right now? And um, I certainly have a lot of uh, concerns about. And I, I, had I had I been an adult and seen myself as a kid actor, child actor, I, I would have been concerned. I, I um, maybe <laughs> I'm still concerned. Because I don't think it's like when people go, oh, you know, oh, my kid wants to be an actor. What what should they do? And I'm very cautious. I'm not, um, I don't encourage them. I encourage them to do theater. I encourage them to check it out, make sure it's something they really like. And then only then after they've trained or you know spent a lot of time on the stage and really decided it's something they really like, then maybe pursue it professionally. But otherwise it's just... Um, you know, as you, as you, well, I don't want to say you guys have mentioned, but we've talked about a little bit that it can be very destructive, uh, destructive to a, um, to a young person. Yeah. We, well, yeah, we were doing a little bit of our own research. I mean, we know your career too, but we like have discovered some new things. Like for example, we didn't realize that your first gig, Josh was actually working with Chris in the old classic Geppetto starring your everyone's favorite Price is Right host, Drew Carey, yeah. as Geppetto. Um, <laughs> yeah. And neither of you were Pinocchio somehow. We've got two you know, stars here, and neither of them end up playing the role of Pinocchio. What, no, what was that right. about? Because I think everyone auditioned for Pinocchio. That's how they get you. They're like, hey, you can be Pinocchio. <laughs> but I don't look anything like Pinocchio. That's a it's like your boy number two. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Um, but, you know, in my case, it actually ended up being boy number one. Oh, yeah. So focus on that. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I, I, I do think, uh, yeah, w audition for Pinocchio. And and I, w you and I didn't have any uh, scenes together, I don't think. No, we didn't you film were, together. No. You were the son of Rene Aubergeois, right? Yeah, I was. Yes. Yeah, okay. I was like the, now, the toy maker's son. That was a coveted role as well. Um, what? I, yeah. <laughs> was and, uh, yeah. I was, I, it was weird. It was like, I got the mini majors. It was like to you, you got one of the MLB starting position. You know, you didn't get the, you didn't get the Babe Ruth. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to use sports metaphor and I don't really know sports, <laughs> but you didn't get the Babe Ruth. You got like the, I don't know, center, center, center outfield or something. But yeah. Center outfield. <laughs> but I got, and, and so, but I didn't, and I didn't get, um, it's not like I didn't get chosen. I got chosen for the JV team or the whatever they go, but I got chosen as like the lead batter on the JV team being uh, boy number one. Um, yeah. That's how I felt at least. Like, fuck, I didn't get a big role, but I got of the small roles, I got the biggest small role. Yeah. And, uh, and Josh, I that's the thing. Is that how I've you heard, remember it? Remember it as you were like, did you get to read a script and think, where do I fit in contextually? Where does this role fit into everywhere? Or um, I think it was just the number one attached to my yeah. boy. <laughs> That's all, yeah. That suddenly yeah, strikes you. Yeah. I, Josh, yeah. I've heard you mention sort of competition quite a few times already yeah. here. And I'm wondering oh, uh -oh. Is this my what, therapy did, session or is No, I was just wondering, <laughs> did you always feel like you were competing or what was there also a fun component with it? Like when you show up so yeah. show up on set of Pinocchio, were you still thinking about dang, I didn't get the part of Pinocchio? Or were you able to have fun on set and enjoy the experience? No, I think I was able to have fun. I wasn't holding any grudges or anything like that. I think that it was something to aspire to. Like I wanted I, you know, it's weird. Competition is so interesting uh, um, uh, uh, because my competition would be with other people to get the role. And then my competition would be with myself once I had the role in terms of how can I be as good as I can be in this role now that I have it. I don't I'm not going to hold on to a grudge that I'm not I'm not a craft service like trying to poison Chris's I, I don't know, <laughs> Arnold Palmer. Um, but uh, I, uh, you know, I. 
I, cause I do remember wanting to be as good as possible. It's so ridiculous too, because I think I had maybe two lines and then one solo and so, by solo, I mean a third line sung <laughs> and then, um, you know, maybe one dance or something, but, but I wanted to be as good as I could be in that role. And so that was the competition kind of became, uh, even though it's, you know, just a one little thing. So, but yeah. That, that so then was it, a, it was a competition for you with, with whatever you were aspiring towards and, and in a way like where yeah. like when you were a kid actor did you have a specific goal in mind already as a kid as to what kind of actor you wanted to be or who you wanted to be did you look up to anybody in particular well it depends it's it's funny how these i don't remember exactly i do remember that i once i started studying acting and it wasn't just about the, the role and i was taking classes and different techniques and all these different things I started thinking about that I wanted to be, and this is so embarrassing, but I, I used to say to myself, I'm going to be the, the greatest actor in the world. <laughs> I am going to be the best actor. He's good. I'm better. He's good. I'm better. Like, it was ridiculous. I mean, For it was why? ridiculous. For why did you I, want well, why? I mean, that's, that's private. That's just, I mean, that's you know, just that's what like makes deep, you tick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I think that I, I just really wanted, if I was going to do it, I wanted to be the best. Like, I wanted to be so good. And I don't think... I think there's, I think that was helpful, but also not helpful. Um, it's something I probably still struggle with because I, because now I've started asking, I think the better questions is, well, yeah, exactly what you say. Why, why would you want to be the best? Also, what does that mean? The best, first of all, there's probably no best, uh, you know, and also, um, you know, what are you really after? Like, what, what is it? Do you, what do you like about acting? Do you just want to be the best or do you like acting? Do you, uh, you know, what is it you want to accomplish? Those types of questions, I don't think I asked myself um, mm. earlier on. It was more about getting the role. And, and that's what I mean about being young and um, kind of winning this popularity contest. Like you have value, you don't. Uh, you got the role, you have value. Oh no, you didn't get the role, you don't have value. I mean, that's mm. kind of the the binary uh, way in which, I mean, did you, does that, can you guys relate to that in, in terms of auditioning for things when you're a, a kid? I personally had a lot wrapped up in certain roles that I desperately wanted and uh, finding out that I didn't get them. And oftentimes they would go to friends and uh, yeah, it can be quite devastating, but it more, it would have, to, it would more often happen to me for the roles that I would get pretty far on and then not get. Like if I went to a third or a fourth callback and I ended up not getting the part, I would find that particularly devastating. But if it was yeah. a first call audition, I don't, and I didn't get a call back. I was like, meh, I can move on. I don't, I don't, it wasn't for me like, oh, I read this script and I absolutely want to play this part and then not getting it, being devastated. Yeah. That didn't happen as much. I mean, that's a really interesting thing. Like, how do you answer the question of why me? Like, why should I have this and on a very personal level when you don't really have that much life experience? So it's yeah, more- Yeah, I, I didn't have, I don't know. I, I didn't, I didn't have that narrative attached to a lot of the, for me, the, the actual auditions I was, I was going on. Like I, I didn't feel there was a little kid that used to come into audition rooms. I'd see all the time. And he was so competitive with me. And he literally, we, you'd go on these commercial auditions and they'd bring five of you down a hallway away from all your parents. And you'd sit in this special row of chairs and then they would come out and they would say, you know, uh, Chris, you're up. And then you, Josh, then you, AJ, and then you, Kevin, and then you, Derek, and and do this. And for some reason, all the agents and managers and and parents and kids, I think, really read into like the order of these things. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and like like who was getting picked to come in first and second and third. And so so it was really important to other people. And there was one this one kid I would see all the time, and he was <laughs> and he would see me. And uh, and if I got picked first and he got picked last, he would go. Looks like they're saving the best for last. <laughs> it's like, and I just, and to me, I just, I never, it took me years to understand what was going on with him. That's I so just, funny. he just scared me and I just thought, yeah. don't look at him. Don't look him in the eye. <laughs> That's all I would yeah. think. But I didn't really, cause, cause I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't have that yet. I didn't have like a comparing myself to other people or necessarily comparing myself to an idea of, I don't know, like what getting this role or not getting this role meant for me just yet. You know, I, I think that for me, it took a long time to, to do that, um, to find those, uh, to find that way of thinking. So was know? it just, I just want to get it because it'll be so fun and it's so fun to audition for it. I don't know. I actually didn't weirdly, I really didn't have 
much thought about getting it or not. Like the most devastating thing that happened for me about really dwelling on whether I got a part after I auditioned for it was there was a role I went out for where they said, are you willing to shave your head? For this role and yeah. uh, all They're the always kids asking that, kids that why do they, they are i don't know heads? well because every kid in the 90s acting had like a full-blown jonathan taylor thomas mullet you know it's yeah. just like yeah, it has yeah. a lot of hair and so this part required me to shave my head and every kid at my school had a shaved head and i hadn't cut my hair in three years because i'm, I'm a kid actor and there's just my hair just needed to be long for whatever yeah. reason and so the idea of cutting my hair was so exciting it was like i ne i was like oh my i would have the excuse to buzz my head like every other kid at my school and I didn't get it. And that's when I was the most devastated. That's where I was the most attached to an outcome. Like, you know, a week went by and I, I asked my parents, did, did you hear on that project? You know, I just, but otherwise I kind of just, I would go in and then let it go. I would just let jo it go. Josh, was there, was there a point, Josh, was there a point where you decided I want to be an actor? Was it a definitive moment for you? This is something Chris and I have discussed. Like I have a definitive moment that I knew I wanted to be an actor. And Chris just like, he started so young, he came into consciousness and he just found himself acting. Yeah. There wasn't a deliberate choice. Was it something deliberate for you? No, um, I, I don't think so. I can think of a few things. I'm really curious what your moment is. Um, I also, it makes me think of, there's a great, uh, Jeffrey Tambor has a story if it's all right to mention him nowadays, um, but uh, he has a great nope. story where yeah, don't right? do okay, it. just don't edit do it. that don't out. Step in it, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I know this is an interview with me, but I, I want to show it because it's so interesting. I think one, he said he was on stage in middle school and he was doing a play, and he started improvising, and someone on stage said, "What are you doing?" And the director yelled from the darkness in the back of the theater, "Leave him alone. He knows what he's doing." And he said that was the moment that he realized that. Um, you know, he that he loved acting and he knew what he was doing. Um, I, I don't, I don't really have, um, I, I, I don't really, I mean, I started doing theater, small town theater in Los Altos, California and the LAYT. I don't know if it's still there, Los Altos Youth Theater. And, um, I first role I got was a, a street rat, a Nicholas Nickleby with my friend. And, um, I had no aspirations to be an actor really. And then, um, I did so another play. Doing, I was doing, doing it because, that? well, initially because my friend, uh, my friend's mom wanted him to do, to be part of the theater, to get in the arts. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't do it unless another friend, that was the deal. Like all audition if, if you get, you know, one of my friends auditioned. So his mom called mine and then we both auditioned and both got roles in this Nicholas Nickleby production. And then, um, I continued on, uh, I think he did one of the shows as well, but I continued on, kept doing the shows and then I kept doing them. And at one point the there was a big part for me. They said, I think they remember them either taking me aside saying like, Josh, you know, we really like that you keep doing these shows. And we think that, you know, you, I don't know what they said. They said something nice. And then they said, we're really considering you for this big role in this next production. It's a funny big role in this small time theater. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I got it. I said, they said, well, are you up for that? Like, are you committed? And I said, yeah. And I got it and I did it. And it was, a, it was a, as, as smashing as a, uh, small town theater, uh, uh, starring role can be, it, it was, it was that smashing. And, um, uh, which probably means they gave me a free pizza at uh, round table, <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah, but, yeah. um, nobody, it wasn't, uh, roses being thrown everywhere. Every time you bow. No, no. I don't think it's roses. Well, how does that segue no, then? How not. do you go from, how do you move from, oh, I guess if my friend needs a friend to do it, I'll show up and okay. Yeah. I guess if you guys need a real commitment and I'll be, you know, the lead character you well, play it, to like, I need to be the best actor of all time. <laughs> I need to yeah. Well, no, guy. but I, you know, I mean, if I'm being honest, I think that that was just, it just supplanted something else. Hmm. I think the, the drive to improve or to be better than, or to prove my worth. I mean, without getting too personal, but that's probably as personal as, as, it, as, as it need be, hmm. um, is, um, you know, it, it 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 just took a new form. I mean, the drive was always there. Yeah. It didn't have to be because of acting. Yeah. The drive was there when I was doing sports, even though I wasn't good in sports. I think the drive was there maybe academically, um, even though I wasn't maybe the best academically. And um, and the drive is there in a way in, in acting, was and probably still is. Um, and um, now I think there's just a little more awareness and maybe uh, understanding around it um, and softness towards it. But... Um, uh, you know, that's just something more personal and in, in, ingrained to me. Um, that makes sense. I mean, I've talked a lot. Yeah, I've talked a lot with AJ about you know that some of the challenges or successes I've found 
in being an actor as a kid and as an adult, uh, I think those challenges and successes would exist. Certain ones would exist regardless of whether I was an actor, regardless of, you know, Absolutely. Uh, and so, Absolutely. you know, the, I, I think that's the, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about former kid actors and actors in general that I, I don't know if they realize how, you know, you, 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 to a large extent, you are who you are, regardless of the endeavor to be an actor. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of, um, people's outcomes personally, you know, uh, have a far less to do with their, what the outcome is in their professional career, um, than it is just who they are. Yeah, yeah. I will say there is one thing about acting, um, and, and in terms of going back to the moment, it just occurred to me is that uh, something I loved about doing theater, and I still do, is the, uh, it's almost like going to camp, the camaraderie, I guess, or the, you know, you're all in this together, you're putting on a show, you're rehearsing, you're getting together, you're hanging out, you're backstage, the show's going on, oh my gosh, something crazy happened, oh, do you hear that? They flood their line, or oh no, I'm late for my entrance, or what happened to this? Oh, this spilled, and you're all, you're just this team working on something in real time for a good period of time before you even open. And then even then it's, it's a, it's a, it may be arguably more fun journey once you're open. Um, and that is something that I think probably is what attracted me hugely to acting in addition to, you know, wanting to hearing the response from other people, um, you know, the audience and, um, and feeling, you know, I guess it's the performer's spirit of just, you know, doing what we do. Um, but, uh, that, that definitely maybe, so I would say that there wasn't really a moment of maybe, maybe a period that formalized to me that I really enjoyed doing this. Now, when you bring that to the professional level, it adds a whole bunch of stuff that can really pollute that, uh, initial, um, initial, uh, passionate reaction interest, yeah, interest in it. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you ever entertain the idea of what life would be like if your friend's mom hadn't called your mom and gotten you to audition for that play? I, you know, I probably just, I love history so much. I still do. And I, I probably would have somehow just stayed in school and studied history and maybe become a professor, which is something I still may do. <laughs> <laughs> still, I feel like that's a lot of actors. You always yeah. get, there's a back burner idea that's probably yeah. been there for decades. Yeah. It's going to stay there you know, probably yeah. for forever. So arguably, probably the, the most known role you did as a kid was playing Dr. Evil in, in Austin Powers. And, um, and I just wanted to know, Agent and I were just curious about that entire process cuz you know speaking of movies being <laughs> the main component to uh, kids culture in the 90s you know did you see Austin Powers and then all of a sudden get the chance to audition for it and lost your mind or was it just another audition or how does that even come into your orbit off Yeah that? um well I, I mean I had seen uh, Spy Who Shagged Me which I think is the first one right I and think so yeah then there was uh, gosh I don't even remember Austin Powers 2 I can't remember the name of that one but anyway, that one's great. Um, so it's the first one. I had seen both of them. In fact, I think I remember going, I remember opening night of Austin Powers 2. It's a huge line, but I had a ticket to go see it. And um, uh, so I remember the theater I saw in a theater on uh, that main stretch in uh, Santa Barbara. For some reason, I was in Santa Barbara. Hmm. And I thought it was hysterical. I must have seen it a few times. And then it was, yeah, years later. I think the story is Jeannie McCarthy, who was the casting director on Goldmember, the third Austin Powers. Um, she saw uh, she saw me on television one night while she had been she had been hired to cast Goldmember, and she knew there was going to be a young Doctor Evil and a young Austin Powers, and they initially thought they could get one actor just like Mike Myers to play both young versions of those two respective roles, mm -hmm. and um, so she was she had been hired for the project and she was watching TV one night and I was lo and behold on TV on her TV um, in a guest star of. Uh, or I don't know if it was guest star, co-star, whatever. But um, again, another boy number one situation, but this time on uh, <laughs> uh, West Wing. And um, uh, and she said she saw my profile and said, oh, Dr. Evil, which is, you know, <laughs> in retrospect, hugely offensive. Because um, uh, he's not the most flattering profile. I mean, you know, if you put him, I've never seen him yeah. on, you know, a character on the wall somewhere, but it, it would be. Anyway, um, and uh, so she brought me in. I guess she found out who I was, called it probably through IMDb. Um, uh, you know, my my meter certainly popped that day. I don't even think they had <laughs> meters back then. Um, and um, uh, called me in, and I uh, had listened to both uh, on Spy Who Shagged Me. I think I either had a DVD or something, was listening to it a bunch, and um, auditioned for young Austin Powers and young Dr. Evil. 
um, we both know that uh, that our uh, mutual friend Aaron Himmelstein ended up getting um, young Austin Powers as he rightfully so because mm -hmm. he was fantastic in it and um, uh, so they ultimately decided it would be two different actors and I think Aaron and I were the final two um, I I also think embarrassingly my dad went to one of these. I don't remember what time of year it was, but it could have been near Halloween or it was just he went to some Halloween superstore and he found a, a Dr. Evil one size fits all onesie, you know, that gray suit. Hmm. And he got it for me because he knew I was up for the role. And I think I wore it to the final callback, which is so embarrassing <laughs> because it was probably, you know, I mean, made for a, a you know, someone between five feet and, or five foot five and six. And I was about four or five or something. I mean, it was... <laughs> um, uh, ridiculous. And, and, um, yeah, so uh, we both got that role and I think they recorded our reactions, although I haven't seen it on some behind the scenes footage. Cause there were some, uh, EPK, uh, electronic press kit cameras. Um, I think there at, while at, you were auditioning. Yeah. yeah not, wow. not, I don't know if they were filming the audition itself or they were just, they were filming like come uh, hang out and yeah, we tell like, you something. <laughs> we, we auditioned and I think we auditioned together. It was very awkward. Actually, I th I'm almost positive. We They brought us both in. It was Aaron and I, and he was doing his, you know, yeah, baby. And I was doing my <laughs> Dr. Evil. And it, But we're playing out because the fourth wall is Mike Myers and, and Jay Roach and a whole bunch of executives and Jeannie McCarthy and probably Nicole Ab Abalera. I don't know if she was there at the time. But anyway, and um, uh, yes, we're just standing doing a scene. And then they said, okay, thank you so much. Mike Myers is kind of snickering. And then we went, they said, you know, go down the hall. We went down the hall in this waiting room. And then I think Mike Myers and Jay Roach came back in with the cameras saying, you got it. Uh, um, I, I may be making this up. I, I don't remember it. That <laughs> well, but I think that's on camera somewhere. How did, and I vaguely uh, remember it. But, but before we pass over, did you, when you had to go, so two things, when you had to audition for Dr. Evil and Austin Powers, were you, since it's such a, a, a known character and, um, and a, a larger than life character, not every day do you have to audition for those things as a kid actor, you know, how does that process go for you practicing this impression? Did it come real easy or did you, did you, did you work with a trainer or a teacher or something or did yeah, you were work you, this up on your just own? All solo or how does yeah. that go? No, it was all solo to get the role. I mean, it was entirely solo to get the role and, and working on the role. I just listened to, you know, do you remember they had these portable CD players? Um, it was silver. I think it was Panasonic. It was oh, the yeah. first portable CD player. It was yeah. about as thick as a brick yeah. and about maybe twice the size of a brick. Yeah. So anyway, I got a spy who shagged me or maybe my dad purchased it for me or something. And I would listen to it, maybe both, but I think bo more spy shagging because it, Dr. E was more featured in that one. And I would listen to it over and over and over with headphones, I think over and over again. And that's how I worked. I mean, the majority of how I worked on that audition and that role. Once mm -hmm. we got the role, um, they had us meet. They had, a, a, I think, an accent coach or dialect coach um, as part of the production. And they mm -hmm. either asked us to meet with them or asked if we wanted to meet with them. But either way, I remember I did. And w the one thing I got from her that was different, well, it was, it was just more of an awareness of something that uh, Mike Myers does. And that was, uh, he has a, he has a Canadian lilt. He is Canadian. And I didn't pick up on that because I didn't, I wouldn't even know to identify that. So it was mm -hmm. helpful to hear that. I don't remember who the dialect coach was. I'm sure we could IMDB her. This is, you guys should get sponsored by IMDB. <laughs> yeah. no, this, is, this um, is it. This is your, yeah, your little yeah. IMDB expert is what we're learning. Yeah. So, oh, and so this experience for you, Josh, and this is the biggest thing you'd done up to that point, correct? Doing this film. I mean, hold on. Let me IMDB myself. <laughs> yeah. um, like I, the biggest production. So. Yeah. The biggest, like it's a movie that you're for sure is going to be out in theaters all across the nation and world. And, you know, does it I mean, feel like that kind of a big deal? Yeah. Was is this that... a monumental point in your career? Do you recall being particularly excited about this one? Um, I don't remember it being monumental. Um, I'm now, I'm literally on my IMDb looking up. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but it was very exciting. It was very exciting because yeah, it was a, and maybe it was the, the first big, um, uh, feature film that I'd done. Um, I, yeah, I'm looking at it. I mean, it looks like it, it, it was. Were, were you really private about that, about your life as an actor in, within school? Um, yeah, maybe there was like a false modesty about it. Um, in that, 
it was kind of cool, you know, to be able to work and certainly to work on cool projects. And there was just a lot of pride in getting a role. And yeah. um, cause, well, cause especially one like that, where that's, I mean, that is something you and your peers, as you sort of put, you're waiting in a long line opening night for the movie at yeah. theaters. It's like, you know, and I think that's, what's so cool. You know, why, why not only is it this iconic, you know, character in comedy film that you got to play younger, but also, you know, not often as a kid actor, do you get to be in things that are that important to your peers? You know, I, when I was a kid, my peers were, were trucked in on buses from New Jersey to New York to see a Christmas Carol out in New York theater. And I was tiny Tim, but every kid going to this, <laughs> this, this show hated this endeavor, like hated the fact that they had to sit through two hours of this dumb musical, a Christmas Carol. And I, it was mortifying for me. I had to get up there and pretend I was um, crippled and sing like a sweet song about being sad on Christmas. And all of my <laughs> friends were like, we're going to kick the shit out of you later. <laughs> when we next time we see you. So not often do you get the experience of doing something that all your peers are going to be very excited about. Well, seeing, yeah, I mean, you know? my memory of Austin Powers is all of us through junior high in early high school impersonating Austin Powers and Dr. Evil. And you were the kid that actually got to play the part and because you did it the best, you did it better than anybody. But we yeah. were all quoting yeah. that film endlessly. Yeah. Yeah, well, no, but you had to be, you had to be win the genetic uh, jackpot of having Dr. Evil's profile. That's all it was. Yeah, that's all it was. I booked it. Well, you, uh, I, I want to ask you too, you mentioned now, like you said, your dad might have gotten you the Spy Who Shagged Me DVD or, or mm -hmm. CD to listen to and and that your dad was there maybe at the audition. And so the the one thing I have no idea about you is like, what, what was your relationship like to your parents? Like who was, did they sort of oscillate between the two bringing you places or predominantly was it your dad that was there with you most of the time? And, you know, and what was your relationship like with your parents this whole time as a kid? Um, I, uh, yeah, it was mostly my dad taking me around. Um, <clears throat> That's rare. Did you yeah. know? It's so rare. Yeah. yeah. It's like 99% moms. Yeah. Did you both yeah. have moms? Whoa. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Both moms. My dad would come in occasionally, but he worked full time. My mom, my mom didn't. So she, she brought us, uh, me and my yeah. brothers. Uh, my dad would just say, I can't believe you're doing this thing. This is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Why are you doing this? But it was your dad. So you had, Wait. so your dad took you around everywhere. Um, yeah, it was, I, I don't know what my mom was doing quite honestly. I, I don't, I mean, I don't. Were your parents married? What? They, they, um, they are, they were, they are, <laughs> um, they, <laughs> were they, not first they, time or something? they are, but they weren't. No, I, I'm joking. Oh. <laughs> uh, I was trying to confuse you. Um, no, they, yeah, I don't, I just don't know what she was doing. I mean, she could have been, I think she was just home listening to Madonna or something. I don't know what she was <laughs> Um, uh, my dad uh, did work as well. Um, but he somehow made it work. I mean, where he'd be on the phone wherever we were or, you know had a pager whenever that was or uh you know or we would stop someplace or um any so number he figured of out, did he figure out a way to work full time and take you to auditions yeah. and sets and stuff he took me around and he managed to do his business at the same time and um so josh was this did it feel like a thing that you and dad did and your mom was not a part of it really yeah i mean i can only remember one time that my mom i was filming up in uh vancouver toronto i think it was toronto actually and my mom flew up to relieve my dad who was staying in the hotel with me for the two or three months we we're up there this is filming a, a disney channel movie um twas the night with brian cranston did it feel like she still supported you or did you not feel oh, yeah. like you got no, support? no 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 okay. i mean it wasn't she wasn't supportive i think she just had you know other things she'd prefer to be doing than you know driving me around to different She's not a great driver either. So, you know, there's that. Maybe it wouldn't be here today if, if she had. I never felt like, um, and I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about uh, this particular point of, of this idea that, um, that my parents pushed me into uh, uh, professional acting or that they wanted me to make monies to pay their bills or buy their things or whatever it was. Um, uh, you know, my dad was a stage dad. Uh, I don't think he put a lot of pressure on me, at least, or certainly not intentionally. Um, so I feel fortunate in that. And he wasn't, you know, I think he would even uh, laugh at some of the other stage parents that, uh, and, and their particularness. I think why I ask is like, you know, I've been very open in my relationship with my parents. You know, my parents are good people. My mom struggled a lot with drug addiction and mental illness, and it, and it had a big effect on my 
life as a kid actor and uh, and my experience growing up acting and uh, and obviously as an adult. And so, you know, and it made being on sets complicated and, you know, where I'm, because I don't know how many people from the outside really realize that, you know, a parent and or guardian is with these kid actors 24 seven is with them on these sets. So they, they go hand in hand, despite the fact that you rarely ever hear or see them. And, yeah. um, and I think they affect every kid actor's life in different ways. And I've known kid actors that had great parents that were just there and present and really helped usher them into, you know, feeling uh, like they had a very fulfilling experience. And I know kids with parents who, um, I don't know, you know, were really detrimental um, and yeah. in, in many different ways. I would offer this from my, from my own experience in that my relationship with my mom today is different as a result of having been a kid actor with my mom being my main guardian and onset person. You know, we spent all day, every day together, and for a period of time lived in a one bedroom apartment together, you know, sharing a bedroom. Like that's a, not a normal kid experience. And so, because we were together, and there's also high stakes, there's high emotions, there's a lot on the line. Each person's risking a lot, living in a new town where you don't know anybody except for each other, at least in the beginning. You know, all of those factors combine to create this different type of uh, parent child relationship. And that has continued on to today. I have two older brothers, and their relationship with my mother is quite different than the relationship that I have with my mother. And that's a, as a direct result of having been a kid actor and my mom being my guardian and main person. Yeah, well, that's the, so. So it was a it was a, a positive effect. You think on your relationship? Uh, I think complicated. It, it, it's yeah, yeah. There's pros and cons to it. Yeah, complicated is the right word. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I I think that I got a sense that it felt like my dad and I were. It was like you know Zuckerman and Son. It felt like we were in business together. We go to the job interview. I would do my thing. He would do his thing. He would talk to my manager or my agent. He would drive me here. He would arrange this if we needed this. He would figure you know. Um and. Uh, uh, so it did feel a little bit like we were in business together as, you know, salespeople and the, and I guess the, the product was me, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, sharper than a set of steak knives, um, <laughs> that was a total dad joke. Um, and, um, so yeah, so I, I, you know, but the other things, there's some great things that came out of it in, 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 maybe it's the same way it's complicated. Um, I mean, just even traveling when we were in Toronto, it's something that just popped in my head was one time, um. We went sailing in this small boat on, uh, gosh, what's which Great Lake is it? Uh, is it Lake Ontario, right I near think Ontario. Ontario? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's yeah. Go with that. Um, and uh, we went sailing in Lake Ontario, and I just occurred to me because I I have a picture of that still. But that happened, and we went to Toronto together because of my work, and so we had that experience together because of my work, and and so, you know, that that's certainly um, uh, something um, wonderful that came out of uh, of having my dad as my stage dad. Yeah. Well, I, I have another question totally separate from all from parent stuff. And I, I was thinking, you know, as you sort of mentioned right off the bat, you're not even sure if you've, you know, if you're still sort of evolving out of being a kid actor into an adult actor. But I, I'm just curious as to that transition into adulthood, that transition where you say to yourself as an adult, okay, I'm going to continue doing this, that evolution. What What is that? What was that like for you? I mean, did you, AJ and I have talked sometimes like, you know, I don't know you in particular, you didn't become like a CrossFit nut. You didn't get like a chest tattoo. You know, you didn't, you didn't suddenly buzz your head into a mohawk. You didn't, you know, you didn't suddenly get piercings everywhere. You, you didn't seem to rebel or change yourself in many ways, but did you, you know, was there something you, was there an Yeah. Was there or... some definitive statement towards your, for yourself that I'm an adult now, or I have transitioned from, from kid actor to adult actor? Um, you know, for a while I tried to gain a lot of weight. Um, uh, muscle. I mean, I was working out with a trainer and I was eating a lot. I don't know. I don't have a big appetite and I don't have a big frame. So it's hard for me to do that. Um, and we talked a little bit about this, Chris, I think last time we, last time we, what we people don't know listening this, yeah. is we yeah. recorded this, we recorded already this. once. Yeah. And, and technical uh, difficulties. Yeah. We technical are, yeah. difficulties. We're doing it again. And, um, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, I tried to gain some weight, um, at, which is difficult for me to keep on. Um, and that, the, uh, the intention of that was to, in a way, grow up in other people's eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm 35 now. There's no hiding that it's on IMDB and, um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and, uh, but I, I still, I think people still see me as I, I look young. My face has always looked young. Um, I am slight. So I think people still see me as, um, 
uh, I don't know, mid twenties, maybe now, maybe late twenties or something. So for I'm still in a way waiting to play my own age or waiting to play young thirties. And, and it's been a problem the past, I would say almost decade. It's been a problem because, mm-hmm. and some people say, no, it's great. We can play young, but the problem I've heard for about a decade is, you know, you, um, you, you, you look young, but you come across older. So we don't know what age you are. So we don't know, you know, you can't play young, but you can't play your own age and you can't play older than your own age. And there's not as much stuff for that's kind of in the middle. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. They, these are the stories you hear, but so inspired. I was inspired, inspired by that feedback to try to change my shape. Um, you know, but that was what, much later. That's into your twenties and stuff or, or even your thirties you're saying. Um, I, I just mean the past, you know, like I say, the past 10 years or so, I mean, ballpark, um, uh, I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't feel a need to change anything other than that, other than as I continue to feel a need to up my game, um, not even a need, a need, but also a desire. Um, and, um, I, uh, I, I also, uh, grew a beard. No. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, well, people, I have a beer right now, but that's, that's just cause I'm quarantining, but that, I think there is something to say about that. I mean, a part of me does not, I, I don't want to have a beard, but I don't want to shave the beard because then I'll look, uh, you know, 23. Yeah, um, I get you. Uh, I get you. So, I've, I've gone through something yeah. that I think very similar as an adult actor. And, you know, it's just like just a couple of years ago that I feel like I finally played an adult, you know, yeah. Yeah, despite playing lots of roles in my twenties and thirties and you know, early thirties, I, I still, it was like, you know, 33 when I finally, I, I got a role and I got this role on a show. And then it was a couple episodes later, they said, Hey, we're in, you're a dad. We're introducing, you have a son. And I was like, did what, did you know oh, that's fantastic. this when you hired me, you know, cause yeah. I don't know. And I don't know if they knew that when they hired me, I don't know if I would have been hired. Cause I don't really, yeah. I feel like I don't suit, I don't look the dad. I get and that. Yet, but your, yeah. your transition to like, did you did acting change for you or was it one fluid sort of trajectory from when you were a kid and g- going from doing that Nicholas Nickleby play with your buddy all the way through? Did it just continue to grow and sort of snowball or was there ever a specific little time where you felt like you were coming out of being a kid, being an adult now and that acting and your relationship to it changed? I mean, as I mentioned, I think that my relationship to acting um, as a craft, as a, if I can say an art form, um, changed when I became more aware of, of when I began to study it um, with uh, different teachers and, and different schools of thought and different techniques. Um, that, you know, that certainly changed then. And, and I, but I think it, uh, you know, usually when you're a kid, you're relying on your instincts, um, or even as an adult, but just your instincts and, and just like, oh, there's nothing to acting. And then maybe, uh, you know, yeah, your relationship can evolve. I don't know if that's answering your question. Um, I feel like no, it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it sounded like you, it sound and correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like, I think like a lot of kid actors, you're sort of blissfully naive about what you're actually doing. You know, there's not, not a lot of kid actors have gone to school or training or learned some method. You're just, you show up as you. And and when you're someone like you, who's very naturally talented and can do all kinds of things and is a really gifted actor and can do things like sing and dance and do plays and lots of theater as well as showing up and becoming Dr. Young Dr. Evil. And then whatever you did six months after that, you know, there's the, you're, you, you are, you're, you're purely instinctual. And then there comes a point as an actor where you go, oh, there's just a lot more to just being instinctual. We, there can be a lot more than just being insti- instinctual as an actor. And let me go delve into that world and yeah. explore that. Yeah, no, I, I think that I remember listening to this Sarah Paulson interview. It was really great. And she was talking about how, and I, and I think it is that you, I love Jim Carrey, you know, as we probably all did in the nineties. And, and so when I would work, I think that I probably was imitating Jim Carrey a lot when I was hmm. really, really beginning actor. Um, it was like this thing that I did. I remember, I think I dressed up as Ace Ventura one day for Halloween before I even started acting one day for Halloween. It was October 31st. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and, um, but, but, and she was talking about how you imitate people like you, that you like, and you kind of get a sense of what works or what doesn't work. And then part of the evolution of your, your craft or your ability as an actor is to kind of find your own. 
And and it's interesting is I don't even know that I fully found that. And and I think it is different. Like there are Jack Nicholson is only Jack Nicholson, and you know, maybe everyone's not meant to be as as specific as that. But I think I spend I spent a lot of my career trying to make it to 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 deliver what works and what I've seen historically works, or deliver a version of someone else's thing. Hmm. And I'm really, really trying to uh find my thing um and 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 uh uh yeah so that that's that's all i would say in terms of um tail ending from where i was to where i am now if that makes sense yeah it makes it, sense and then josh for you in in this same transitionary period from kid to adult you're one of the few people that we know that went hard at the collegiate route and you went so far as applying to and attending Princeton mm -hmm. and that, you know, when you look at, um, you also were in a frat, we read and you had a nickname, a couple of nicknames. Yes. Well, I don't know. What, Do you remember? I, I mean, know. I, I know my name. Yeah. No, yeah. Checkers. checkers. Checkers is my nickname. Yeah, and Boo Boo. Yeah. And Boo Boo. No, no, baby. Boo Boo is not. <laughs> Boo Boo is, I don't know how that got Boo Boo is the one okay. you try to forget, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boo Boo was on uh, Saturday night. Checkers follow you the that. rest of the day. Yeah. <laughs> Boo Boo. So, <laughs> was that something, Josh, that, that for you, you always knew that you wanted to do, even while you were seeing all the success as a kid? Did you know that college was always um, part of the plan for you? I don't think I knew. I think I just assumed. You know, I think we're coming to a time where people are thinking less and less that it's it's necessary or or expected. I just expected that I would go to college. I assumed I would go to college. Um, and... I went to a, a, a very good high school and they, um, they were adamant about it as well. They had, you know, college counselors, counselors. That's what, what I'm looking for. Thank you. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I, um, I guess it was just, yeah, just, I also wanted, especially after seeing as many films as we did and, and, and a lot of films in the nineties, you, you thought that that, that, that was the experience you wanted was to go to college and meet a bunch of people and meet a bunch of girls and drink and, you know, just have that co uh, the quintessential American uh, collegiate experience. I think that's really what I wanted more than anything. And I, and I wasn't too aware of it. It's just when I started approaching that in you know, junior year, senior year that I, uh, uh, that I, you know, sort of thinking about where I might want to go. And, um, uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to get into Princeton and, um, I only went for a year, uh, which is yeah, cooler why? than graduating. Uh, <laughs> it is cooler than graduating. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you rejected Princeton. You're like, yeah, yeah. you let me in, yeah. but you know um, what? I tried it, but I'm not interested. And you um, stopped because of acting. You decided I'm just, I'm not, I don't want to go to school. I want to just continue and focus all my efforts acting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I almost left after my first semester. Um, I, I was, um, I was doing a play. I was trying to, I didn't like their theater program or they didn't really have a theater program. I'm saying, but they're theater troops and they weren't doing plays. I wanted to do, I wanted to do a production, I think of Kenneth Lonergan's, this is our youth. And I wanted to play the role that I'm not really right for, which is Dennis to someone else's Warren, I think, or maybe I'm, I'm pretty positive. Or maybe I wanted to play Warren. I don't know. I wanted to do, I had read the play and worked on a play in a scene study class before I'd gone to college and I really wanted to do it. So I found this black box on campus and I tried to make it work and ended up not happening. We rehearsed it a bunch and then we never put it up because my dad became ill and I had to leave uh, for a few weeks and just the whole thing fell apart. But um, uh, it was, it, that was the stipulation is if, if I can figure out, if I can... Uh, Okay, I will stay another semester, and this is actually the first time my parents really intervened in my life, and it, it, to my knowledge, and I, and it, but it felt supportive. They said, "Listen, you can leave if you want, but we'd really like you. We think you should. We think you should finish. We think you'd be glad if you finished the year." And and it was the first time. I guess it, it come to think of it, it's one of the first times that I felt that both my parents collectively parented me. Hmm. Um, it felt supportive and nice, and I as they expressed a responsible opinion and i and i agreed e even if a little bit begrudgingly um anyway but uh yeah that was the stipulation that i would i would do this play if i stayed and i tried to do the play we rehearsed it a bunch and then so you were i mean in a way though you're itching to get out you're just itching to act and you're itching to figure out how yeah however you can you, you know and so that's the trade off is okay well i'll stay here if i can continue to act so when you look back at that decision though do you 
do you feel like, have you ever revisited that and thought, I wish I stayed or do you, are you've always been happy about that decision leaving or has that affected you in any other way or? No, no, not in any negative way. I don't think I I don't, uh, I don't regret leaving. I mean, um, yeah, it's nice to finish what you start, but, um, I think I had a lot of great experiences that I left for. So for, for anybody listening, right, we, I, I want to sort of segue into, you told us a story, Josh, that we had to re-record because we wanted to tell the story, but yeah. we wanted to be cryptic and discreet and not put any names into it. And we right. did this because it was something that happened to you that you didn't feel personally hurt by and that you didn't feel anyone else was hurt or negatively affected by, right. um, but that you also recognize that uh, if you put that same scenario into today's climate, um, it could potentially get people in trouble or uh, at least cause some sort of a stir. And and uh, and it's because someone was on set and they were really immature. And they're also um, we're very they're very well known. So you know, not, not nobody wanted to get a phone call from a lawyer. And we also we felt. Um, you know, we felt we took your lead on this, that, uh, that, you know, a comfortable way of telling the story is with no names, but we also want to tell it because, uh, it's, it's, funny. it's fucking it's hilarious. It's, a great, <laughs> yeah, story. it's yeah. a great story. So if you wouldn't mind regaling us once again with this story, um, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. This, so this were, were, we, we recorded it, then we re-recorded it. Now we're re-recording it. <laughs> we're re-recording again. the re-recording. This is yeah. the make America great again. So, I was working on, as you as you mentioned, and and all these caveats being that nobody was, you know, I don't think anybody was offended by what happened. But I was, just repeat that one more time. But I was working on a high profile project, and a high profile figure um, was involved. Is the is the uh, is the person of interest in this particular story? So um, I am waiting on set uh, for uh, for the said guy let's just call him um <laughs> andy i don't know that's, yeah, okay. i swear that's not his name i don't know andy is that a, okay so um so we're waiting for andy to come to set and the director is um facing me and i'm facing the director and the director's in a chair and andy arrives on set uh <laughs> unbeknownst to the director because the director has his back to him and the um the bald-headed director very cue ball, bald headed director sat in this. He looks very tired, he's comfy in this chair. And he's, he's, I don't, I don't even think he's talking to me. He's probably just trying to sleep or something, just waiting for Andy. So Andy arrives. I see Andy. Director doesn't see Andy. Andy proceeds to put his, uh, his finger up to his lips for the universal shh sign. And then, um, Andy then un does his pants, I mean, i.e., I think unzips, unbuttons, then unzips, pulls down his pants, pulls down his underwear, pulls out his um, member, and (laughs) places it gently, very gently, on top of the director's bald head. (laughs) Now... Everyone, I mean, everyone's watching. I, the, the you know the second AD is there. The you know the grips are there. People are snickering because they were all told the universal sign of shh. So they're all just snickering. And and the directors were like, hey, I th- I think it's there for a good. I mean, longer than it should be. Not like a microsecond. <laughs> like at least a second, two he seconds. He didn't swat it away like a bug. No, just, I think he was just. He thought maybe someone put their hand on top of his head or something. I don't know what he thought. Or like maybe they put. A slinky on his head. I don't know what they thought, <laughs> and um, maybe a, a Twinkie. And um, and they and then he only, after two three seconds, uh, kind of shudders and turns around and notices that uh, Andy um has his dick out. <laughs> There's a set of balls in his <laughs> face. A set of balls in his face. <laughs> and then everyone starts laughing, and Andy puts away his stuff, and and uh, the director laughs and probably you know tries to rub off the grime on top of his head for a little bit. And um, that's that's the story. But like I said, nobody. Said, and you went straight, and you guys went. Uh, went we into- went on with our day. We, I think we were yeah. waiting for Andy to start the rehearsal, and then we went into the rehearsal. <laughs> it was the they rehearsal. had a good, you know, joking relationship. So I think it was all in fun, and they probably yeah. both uh, look back on that moment very fondly. Yeah, um, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm absolutely was, sure. Uh, yeah. So that was that was the story that. Uh, yeah, that, great, great. I, I, I'm glad well it's done. a great retelling. And so, so it begs the question too, right? Like, did you growing up? Did you ever feel? Did you have a largely just pod or 
a completely positive experience, you know, to, you know, minus perhaps some, some immature antics. Was there ever anything really challenging you think you faced as a kid actor? Was there, was there something? The challenges came from the fact that, that Hollywood is not, and it's still in a way, some of the challenges still do is Hollywood is not a meritocracy because you would feel like you really worked hard on a role. You, you, you know, you, you, you ace the test, you study for the test, you ace the test and yet you didn't get an A, you didn't get the role. You know, um, and that's a hard thing to understand as a kid because you take it very, very personally, especially mm -hmm. when you feel in a way with with a parent there, whether they're supportive or not, you feel that you're letting your parent down and you feel like you're letting yourself down and you feel like, oh, you know, that that kid's better than me or maybe that kid's cuter than me or why did you know, you start to feel these things and take it very personally. And that could be. Like I said, I mean, I, I think that that could be very destructive and, and detrimental to to someone's um uh to someone's upbringing. Um, was it? Do, do you yeah. feel it was to you in in different ways? Were there, were there times where it bogged you down, or those things really ate at you? I think that I fell into the trap of it. I certainly felt like my worth was in question, um, or uh, you know. There, there, there have been, I mean, and that's also Hollywood. I mean, I felt also just on the flip side of it. I mean, I felt there was a time after Sex Drive came out, which is another film I did more into my adult. I mean, I was, a, I was 20, 21 at that point. But Sex Drive was, was a mini major film in terms of budget, but then it, it, it pulled really well in all these test audiences. So they thought it was going to be a big, big hit, just like Super Bad. Um, and in the same mold and it wasn't, it was a big flop, but prior to it coming out and being a flop, um, the buildup was such that, uh, you know, there were, they put all this money in the advertising. And so you know, there's a photo of you on a billboard all over Los Angeles and over buses and, and all these different things. And people want to talk to you and there's interviews and you do a press junket and everyone says how great you are. And, and CAA, which is the, you know, the top agency of, of, of top stars hollywood stars is calling your manager saying they want to represent you uh josh and all these different crazy things and then you go to the movie premiere and it's at the uh, uh westwood whatever that village theater is right there in the nexus of um in the heart of um of westwood, westwood. and yeah and um and uh and then the movie's a flop and nobody you know the billboards come down caa stops calling every nobody calls you nobody even says like oh well Guess it didn't work out. It's just everything stops, and so it, it, it's been the opposite as well. You start to feel when you when when there's all this buildup, you start to feel, oh, well, maybe I'm maybe this is it. Like maybe I'm great. Maybe you know. So yeah, I, I I think that you can't. Um, those things really mess with you. Hmm. And no um, one, you know, the yeah. other thing is no one teaches you this stuff starting as a kid. It, it, like, how could you possibly be expected to know like the level of emotional fortitude that you need to have? Or how are your parents supposed to know how they're supposed to parent you through those moments or what could yeah. possibly be coming down the pipeline? No one tells you any of this stuff. And we yeah. all had kids, agent, kids agents, man, you know, kids managers and stuff. You'd think that this, we've been doing this, you know, young actor thing for long enough that these you know, potential pitfalls are pretty well uh, defined at this point, but yet nobody really talks about any of this. And mm -hmm. you, you like that experience you had could have potentially been easier should somebody had prepped you for it and given you, you know, realistic expectations of how these things go or helped you. Well, may, it. maybe, maybe not because no one's got a crystal ball. And also, yeah. I don't know how they deal with kid actors nowadays. Um, but I, I mean, I get it. I mean, look, the ruthlessness of the entertainment industry towards actors and everybody that's about directors, writers, producers, you know, the, the sort of fair weather friends that, that, um, success, uh, can make for people is, really tricky to navigate as adults. It gets really, <laughs> I feel like, yeah. you know, I've, I've, I've often tried to mention in these conversations how, tr how tricky it is if you're a minor or just becoming an adult and you have a very limited toolkit, you know, in your toolbox to be able to deal with life yeah. that, you know, cause that, 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 yeah, that it, I think that's hard for people to understand when weirdly, you know, there's a success you see out in the general public. And then there's a success you can see within the entertainment industry.
And so when you talk about sex drive going on this roller coaster where it's just up and up and up because this movie's the, everybody, the entertainment industry gets excited for a movie and starts to treat it as though it's going to be this next giant thing. And they treat you like you're the next giant thing. And then box office numbers come in. And if it's an underwhelming number or not as, as expected, uh, yeah, that carpet can get pulled out from under you. I've experienced that more often than I've experienced anything else in, wow. in my career. And it's, sucks it sucks and it sucks because you know when you're for me it sucked for me because when i young i didn't know what was happening and so i just you know you do you equate it to your self-worth you know you don't quite equate it to for me i didn't equate it to um the way of the business i kind of thought wow i guess uh people got real cold real fast you know and the same people that seem to really dig what was happening um yeah just not not even just a few months prior yeah, and, and like you say, especially when you haven't had the life experience to really understand the context of what's happening and yeah. understand that it is a business. I mean, it's a business and you're a commodity uh, in, mm. in some people's eyes, but you're also a person and, you know, that's uh, more important, um, but th- the industry might not see it that way. And so you have yeah. to, you know, look out for yourself. So, I mean, look, it's hard enough to grow up in general, but you add on this idea. I think that's the, th- the thing is you're supposed to g- grow up and it's supposed to be difficult to grow up and you and have these weird relationships and ha- with, you know, with friends and get in fights and have, um, you know, have your first breakup, ask, you know, first person out, it feel all these different things. And then maybe have some context going into college and, or, or whatever, going in the early twenties. And, and then, um, and then as you're entering the, uh, business world, but, um, to be doing both at the same time is a little, uh, is a little strange. Um, mm. uh, yeah. And, um, it's, I still find it funny how actors are treated, you know, I mean, actors are, are equally treated. I mean, it depends who they are. Right. But actually, uh, actors are equally treated like um, the most important people in the world. And then often like, like the, the, the least important. I mean, yeah, it's just the, funny. The worst, yeah. The yeah. worst villains and the biggest superheroes. Yeah. yeah. You know what we like to ask everybody on the podcast, our, our final couple questions. The first one is if you had a kid, if you have kids uh, and they said to you, I want to be an actor. What do you do? What do you say? Oh God, um, that's that's it. Oh God, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know how anyone can. I, okay, you want to be an actor? All right. Well, I mean, let's. You know, I think I think that. Okay, fine. You want to be an actor, but you know, first you got to act. So you know, maybe the thing is to uh, say to 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 you know. To go into theater, I, I already mentioned. I think that I, yeah. I'm a big fan of theater, and I think that I think it's hell, even if you don't want to be an actor, even if you want to be um, a bricklayer, um, you know, you want to uh, you want to get into uh, to theater. I think it's a wonderful place to be. Um, there's so many great plays, and you can learn a lot from that. But also, you learn a lot from the interpersonal skills of working with other people, and and um, you know, so many different things. What it, what it's like to have a responsibility to others and and to yourself, and you know, performance aspect, public speaking. Um, I mean, <laughs> which is something I needed on that particular term, public speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, yeah, no, this is this is super great. I I hope just whoever's listening, however great you think this particular interview was, the one we <laughs> recorded that was lost uh, due to technical negligence. Um, <laughs> uh, was m- much, much, much. Better. It was a masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. Really so we'll take, the, uh, yeah. We'll take a B plus here. Library That's of Congress. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thanks Thank you, guys. you so much, Josh. Thanks yeah. everybody for listening. It's another episode of the Coogan Chronicles. Yeah.